Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. How many of you like reading bumper stickers? Do you get up close at the stoplight to see what that one really does say? Some are amusing. Some share their religious or their ethical views. Some are political, especially during election seasons. There are a few that I've seen that are shocking with their crudeness. I won't share those with you. I recall seeing an old car in Florida where rust is always a danger to cars. And I was sure that the car was held together by all the many and various bumper stickers from many ages that were holding this car all together and dated that car. You know, I considered that today's lesson, today's gospel lesson, could be reported on many and various bumper stickers, which could help hold our lives together. Think about it. Don't be afraid, little flock. God loves you and wants to give you good things. Sell your stuff and give to the poor. Where your treasure is, there's your heart. Be dressed for action. I like that one. And imagine what that could mean. Be ready. Be alert. When we read scripture like this, there is sometimes anxiety stirred up within us. Are we ready? Are we alert enough? Are we too afraid and not trusting God enough? Do these very questions cause you anxiety? Through the years, uh, Randy and I, my husband and I, we've tried to impart knowledge to our children about being alert. Not surprisingly, as a mother, with every story I read or heard about a, a possible danger, I would share with my children ways that they could protect themselves. I wouldn't necessarily tell the details of the story, but I'd share enough that I had their attention. Honestly, I'm not always sure that they appreciated the motherly advice that I was offering, but you know how that goes, such as, be alert, look around, know where you are, know who is around you, watch people without staring, but watch for nonverbal clues as to what's going on as well. Next, look for exits and exit strategies. Spend a few minutes to contemplate how we would leave a building, including what we would take and what we would leave behind. My husband always puts our passports when we're traveling in his um, I don't know what you call it now, but you know the fanny pack. I know that's old-timey, but anyway, uh, whatever that pocket is right there, so that we would have them should we need to exit in an emergency. Um, and we shared that and others with our children. Next, go with your gut instinct. Is your gut telling you to be aware of something, of someone, to go in a different direction, to leave you know, I do believe that our gut instinct is a gift from God. Too often we ignore that, that, you know, that feeling right here that tells us something's not quite right. We too often ignore it because of, well, we think it's silly. We shouldn't feel that way. Or shame. Or a number of reasons. But we need to listen to that gut and pay attention to it and act on it. Another, limit distractions. If we have headphones or earbuds on, can we still hear what's going on around us and be aware of that? Back in the old days, we used to use the phrase, they always have their nose in a book. Now we have many devices to consume our time and attention. Being distracted allows us to be vulnerable. And one more, walk tall, walk with purpose. Hold your head up, put your shoulders back, looking about. This limits the appearance of being defenseless. So fear not is often used in the scripture, and I've preached on it a number of times. It's often been quoted, however, and used as a shaming device in parts of the Christian world. 
As we've studied the human brain, we know that fear is a natural reaction to danger. Like our gut instinct, I believe that fear is a God-given gift so that we don't walk blindly into situations that can harm us, hurt us. Now, I know that there are fears that do need to be overcome, perhaps even through mental health professionals. I can understand that not every fear is positive, but not every fear is negative either. For example, I had to work early on on my fear of public speaking in order to be where I am today. Not every fear puts us in peril. And the fear mentioned in today's gospel lesson is about the fear of trusting God and living in God's kingdom. You know, trusting God brings both joy and fear as those women experienced finding Jesus had risen from the dead when they were in the garden. We have great joy in knowing that God, the creator of the universe, wants what is best for us. God loves us and cares for us and wants us to live in such a way that we live with joy, with purpose, with meaning, and with grace. And the fear? Well, that fear comes from the creator of the whole universe wanting a relationship with little of us. The magnitude of what that might mean is a bit, bit overwhelming and frightening at times. The other day when I was getting out of our um, neighborhood swimming pool, a little girl about three was coming in. And I've been greeting her and talking to her father regularly for weeks. And that day, as she's coming in, I spoke to her as I was going out, and she started wailing, just crying beside herself. I had frightened her. And I have no idea why that particular day I scared her. What was different from all the other days? And her father said, while comforting his daughter, said to me, she's a bit dramatic. <laughs> and I responded, aren't we all? <laughs> what are the days, why are there days and times that we are fearful of God and what God is offering us? Sometimes we tell ourselves, Stories that may or may not be true. We doubt God's love. We doubt our worthiness. We doubt the experiences we've had up until this point that point to God's goodness. We forget to count our blessings and express our gratitude to God. We listen to the voices of this world that tell us the opposite messages of what Jesus is teaching us. And honestly, these deceitful messages of this world fill our ears and our eyes at a more frequent rate than the time we spend with God and the holy messages offered by the Holy Spirit. We hear today these words, do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In a former life, I was a manager at a business, and I worked with another manager who would respond to words of gratitude with, it's my pleasure. And each and every time she said this to whoever the customer was that it was at her desk, her desk was across from my workspace, and so I could see this. And I thought to myself, come on. Does she really mean that? Every time, with a smile on her face, it's my pleasure. So one day I asked her about it, and expecting to have her laugh and say something funny. Well, she humbled me. But she said, it is her pleasure to serve and work for others. And if it's not, that's her goal, is for it to be her pleasure to work with the public and to help people. Do we deserve God's good pleasure? You know, that's really the wrong question to ask and the wrong way to look at it. 
For if we consider if we are deserving, then we do become fearful. For we know in our hearts that we really aren't worthy, and then our minds go down that rabbit hole. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom of God is near us, and we don't want to miss out on it. That's why we have the list of practices that we are to follow, so that we aren't distracted by this world, by the noise and the ads and the come-ons and the temptations to embrace the extra fluff and stuff. Sell your stuff and give to those in need. Make a purse for yourself that won't wear out, that a thief won't steal, that a moth won't eat. In other words, make a purse that is filled with the riches of God's kingdom. Be dressed for action. Doesn't that strike your imagination, what that might look like? Be dressed for action. Be observant. Be alert. Listen to your gut. Hone those skills that I taught our children as if we were watching for the kingdom of God and where God wants us to be. Don't miss out on the kingdom of God coming near us. Not because you'll be punished with an eternal damnation, but because we'll miss the holy. We have a friend who is a pastor in Switzerland, and this week he posted something that I want to share with you. In their Presbyterian church and other Celtic church traditions, we have a term called thin place. This is a sacred space where the veil between heaven and earth seems so thin that it feels like it can be crossed. And he goes on, one thin place for me is the Stadtkirche of Aral, which I pray will never be swamped by the throng of tourists, like many of its counterparts across Switzerland. Each time I come here, it is quiet and peaceful, and its stillness reminds me of God's great care and helps me to recapture my love for the church. Have any of you experienced this thin place? This place where God seems especially close. While our friend preferred a quiet, empty church, I recall the visiting and experiencing the holy at Stephen's Dome in Vienna, Austria, St. Stephen's Cathedral. Some of you have been there. This, was the main, this is the main church in the heart of the city. And it was very near our apartment and very close to the church where we worshiped. And I loved on my daily walks, walking into Stephen's Dome. There would be crowds of people, tours, tour guides with their umbrellas or their poles so all their tours would know, all their people would know where they were. There were languages, multi-languages, as these tours were speaking in all the different languages. And there were murmurings and noise and bustle as people tried to maintain a respectful level of sound and soaring above this mass of humanity was this magnificent cathedral, long and high. Thousands of hours went and still goes into this facility, built to honor God and to host worship to God. The carved wood points to the craftsmanship of those people long ago who worked on the pews, the statues, the pulpits, the choir lofts, the beautiful tile on the floor, and that stained glass, oh my, it's breathtaking and almost unimaginable in its beauty. And I felt like hovering over this mass of humanity was the Holy, was the Holy Spirit who was pleased to offer the kingdom to whomever and wherever people are present. The thin place for all Christians, and especially those denominations that honor and value the sacraments, a thin place is available every week with the sacrament of Holy Communion. When we hear the words of the liturgy and then come together as a community 
to participate in this age-old holy meal, we truly are receiving the bread of life and the cup of blessing. When we get to celebrate a baptism, where the one being baptized, no matter their age, is surrounded by loved ones, their family, their friends, by the community of Christ. When water is poured on their head in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all of God's children will exclaim, Amen. It is a time of thin place where this sacred space, where the veil between heaven and earth seems so thin, like it can be crossed, that we really are experiencing the Holy One. That thin place is available to each and every one of us, whether in a magnificent cathedral, or as said last week, in God's gorgeous creation, in the receiving of the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, the holy is wherever you are. When you take a moment or receive a moment of opening your defenses, of opening your hearts and your mind, your life to the Holy One. It is God's good pleasure to give this to you. And for that we say, thanks be to God. Amen.